So this morning is the first of two messages intended to answer the question, who is the devil? Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about who God is. We've looked at 23 different characteristics or attributes, what he's like. This morning, we're going to look at the devil's origin, his power, his end, and his strategy. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, not to be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. The word schemes there literally means his purpose. We're not to be ignorant of what he's trying to do. So this message will be in part about that, but next week's even more so. We were first introduced to the devil in Genesis chapter three, verses one to 15. But he existed outside and prior to the Garden of Eden. So who is he? Let's talk about it. In your outline, first of all, number one, the devil's origin. Under that, first, the devil began with God. He began with God. The devil, like us, is a created being. God made him an angel. I'm gonna read some verses that will reference that here in a moment. And he made the angels like he made us, and that is with the ability to choose. Which brings us to number two, and that is the devil rebelled on God. He began with God, then he rebelled on God. Listen to what it says in, about the devil in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, place of the dead, to the recesses of the pit. Now, a word about prophecy in the Old Testament. Sometimes the prophecies have a dual fulfillment. There will be an, the prophecy is initially about something that may be going on there. This next passage I'm gonna read you is, is, is in reference to the king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. But they also often have a, a, uh, a, another uh, fulfillment later in history, most of them in the end times. And so as I read this one, this is one of those kinds of prophecies. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 17. Thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, which lets us know he's talking about the devil, the garden of God. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, created until unrighteousness was found in you. You were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I've cast you as profane from the mountain of God and I've destroyed you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. In Revelation chapter 12, verses three to four, the devil's called the great red dragon. And we're told there that he swept away a third of the stars of heaven with him. Almost all theologians agree that what this means is when he rebelled against God, he was able to convince a third of the other angels to join him. And so two thirds of the original angels would still be in heaven. One third are now the devil and his demons. So the devil's created by God. He rebelled on God, cast out of heaven with a third of the angels who went rogue with him. And then we come to number two. Let's talk about the devil's power. The devil's power. How powerful is he? London, I've got several things. First, the cursed world is his world. The cursed world, the one we live in, is his world. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul calls the devil the God of this world. Just after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, if you remember, he was tempted by the devil in Luke chapter 4. In one of those temptations, the devil, devil offered Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verse 5 all the kingdoms of the world if he would bow down to him. And the devil said, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Now the thing to notice there is that, that Jesus didn't dispute that the devil could do what he was saying he would, he would do. 
Jesus didn't dispute that this world was at that time and still at our time, his world. He just didn't bow down. The cursed world is the devil's world. Number two, the devil's power is great. The devil's power is great. And we'll talk about this here and I'll come back to it a little bit later. In 1 John chapter 5, 19, it says that the whole world lies within the power of the evil one. In Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 to 12, we see one of the times that the magicians of Egypt duplicated the miracles performed by Moses. So Moses would perform a miracle, and then the Egyptian magicians would perform the same miracle. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, we see that the eventual Antichrist dies and is raised from the dead. His false prophet performs, says this of him there, performs great signs. He even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And listen closely to the next thing he says. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the Antichrist, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the Antichrist who had been killed but has come back to life. Listen closely to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, Jesus uses the word many, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles, three specifics, okay? Well, the second one, the third one's kind of a general, more general word. And Jesus said, I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice that Jesus does not deny that these men did these things. That's really important to see. He didn't say, you didn't, commit, you didn't work any miracles. You didn't cast out any demons. You didn't uh, prophesy. He didn't say that. They had done those things. What he tells us here is that the devil will perform miracles through unsaved men. Don't miss that. People who don't know the Lord, don't know his word, are sitting ducks for anyone who can perform or fake miracles. They're sitting ducks. Remember that the devil, quote, deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. That's how he does it. Jesus says that there will be those who perform miracles in this life who aren't even Christians. Many of the, and, and the problem is, not only if somebody does that, do a lot of people think they're Christians, they think they're the greatest Christians. They think they're the most close to God, most gifted by God. And Jesus says, I don't even know you. You're not even mine to many of us. So many of these same gullible people live under the illusion that people would get saved if they saw miracles. Well, if we had miracles in the church, more people get saved. That just isn't true. The children of Israel, if you remember, were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And then God sent Moses down there to get them out. So they came out of there. They saw more miracles probably than anybody except the disciples of Jesus. So what they see, they saw God devastate Egypt. They saw the Dead Sea part. They saw it, the bottom of it, instantly dry. It had probably never been dry. And they walked through on it. And as soon as they got the other side, it collapsed on and destroyed the entire Egyptian army. The Egyptians, as they left, gave them their riches, if you remember. They gave them everything they had just to get them to leave because God's judgment's on Egypt. And then they, while they're in the wilderness, they get manna from heaven six days a week. And a few times they get quail. So God rains meat on them. Twice, God brings water from a rock, enough water for probably two million people and all the livestock they had with them. Did these people see some miracles? <laughs> I mean, wow. You say, well, if I saw that, I'd believe anything God said. No, you wouldn't. You probably wouldn't. They didn't. 
So these same people who experienced all these miracles, God wants to take them in the promised land. They won't go. They're doubting. They're unbelieving. The miracles hadn't convinced them of anything. And so they didn't go in, if you remember. Then they tried to go in, got defeated. And so God leads them around the wilderness for 40 years so that every male anyway, 20 years and older, dies in the wilderness. And then he takes their children in. Well, if we had miracles, people would get saved. That's just not true. These people experienced those miracles. In Luke chapter 16, verse 31, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. They both, Lazarus the beggar, they both die on the same night. Lazarus ends up in heaven, uh, the beggar, and the rich man ends up in hell. Not because he was rich, but because he, uh, hadn't, he wasn't, hadn't trusted Christ and followed the Lord. And so he, he's down there, it's awful. And he tell, he, uh, and he and he's asked Abraham, he can see into heaven, which is real interesting. There's no place in the Bible says that people in heaven see into hell. Why not? Because we don't need to know what we miss to know what we've got. What we've got will be so good, it won't matter what we missed. But apparently a part of what hell is, is people in hell can see into heaven. Because rich man saw into heaven, he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus. And he had brothers still living on the earth who so wanted to go back and warn them. And so he asked Jesus, let me go, or asked Abraham, let me go back so I can warn my brothers so they don't come to this place. And Jesus said to them this, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. So if we could actually perform a real resurrection, people would get saved, wouldn't they? Well, not according to the Bible. Miracles don't give faith. So where do we get faith? We get it from God and we get it from his word. Listen to Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So the devil's power is great. He can and apparently does produce miracles to distract people from the truth and from the true God. Miracles do not produce faith, nor do they prove, listen closely, they do not prove that someone's gifted by God, being used by God, or even knows the Lord. He could be an unchurched person and work a real life miracle. In our day of Christian celebrity showboats and con men, it's really important that you remember this. Now, here's the third thing. The devil's power is limited. It's limited. He's powerful, but he's limited. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. The devil is on a leash. His power is limited. If Jesus has all authority, then the devil can only do what a sovereign and omnipotent God allows him to do. It's not a case of WWF wrestling where in the present, the devil is whooping the tar out of God. But we know near the end, I've got some of your attention now, didn't I? Okay. But we know that in the end, God's going to get his second breath and he's either going to put a brain duster or a warp your head off hold on him and win. In the last moment, our God will win. But between now and then, he's getting killed. Nothing could be further from the truth. God, no matter what things appear to be, God is always winning and the devil is always losing. Jesus has all authority. So the devil's power is limited. We'll come back to that here in a moment. The Bible does teach, number four, that the devil can control a lost person. He can control a lost person. In Luke 22, 3, before Judas went to betray Jesus, it says Satan entered into him. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we read earlier that the God of this world has done what? He's blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So people ought to see, don't see. People ought to believe, don't believe. Why? Because their minds have been blinded by the devil. In 2 Timothy 2, 26, it talks about people escaping the snare of the devil having been held captive to do his will. Now, let me say something that's really important. You can think you see and be blind. Come back to that at the very end. 
and you can think you're free when you're bound. You can think you're doing God's will when you're doing the devil's will. About to give you an illustration of that. The devil blinds minds, binds wills that can control the lost. Number five, the devil can only influence a believer. He can only influence a believer. The devil can't inhabit or possess a man who's in Christ. Why? Because Christ is in him. In 1 Timothy 5.18, it says, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who, is, who was born of God, Jesus, keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, the verse is not saying that Christians never sin. It's saying that Christians don't continue in sin. They may struggle, but Christ is in them, bringing them to repentance. This is crystal clear in the Greek verb tense. God lives in us, empowers us, changes us, the devil can influence us, but he cannot dictate what we do. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says that your, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How many of you have ever read the, the classic Pilgrim's Progress? If you haven't, you need to read it. It's a fabulous book. You'll need a vocabulary. You'll need a dictionary because it's written a long time ago when people were infinitely smarter than they are today. He's got a, he'll use words you've never heard of and they're fantastic words and great descriptions. But it's about a guy named Pilgrim who's trying to get to heaven, the celestial city. It's an allegory and it's just, the, how biblical it is is just fantastic. So Pilgrim is on his way to the celestial city and he gets this point where he runs into not one but two roaring lions. And he thinks he's got to go between them. He thinks, I, I can't do it, I'm a goner. But as he gets closer, he notices they're both on chains. And turns out he can get right between them and they can get real close to him, but neither of them can touch him. Say, so where'd that come from? That came from this verse right here. The devil can't touch those who are the Lord's. Some of you remember Flip Wilson, the comedian from years ago. And he'd say, the devil made me do it. Remember that? Well, if you're a believer, the devil didn't make you do it. Not according to 1 John 5, 18. He can lie to you, he can cause you to fear, but he doesn't get to choose what you do, you do. And by the way, the roaring lion, usually how that works is in Africa, as the lions get older, they get slower. And Betsy and I years ago did this, this uh, lion walk, we actually got a video of it and everything, and we walked with four uh, one-year-old 200-pound lions. They were probably about this big, and we walked and they did a, it's a video where the lion sleeps tonight, it's pretty cool. But anyway, these are, these are young lions. They've trained to do this. They don't use aggressive lines. I asked them um, when we were doing it one time, uh, uh, when we did it, the time we did it, that uh, I said, you ever have any other animals get in here? Because this is a fenced off area, but it is Africa. He said, yeah, once we did. He said, it was unbelievable. The lions instinctively surrounded him. And these are lions that have grown up in cages, but they knew exactly what to do. They just surrounded him. And that's what lions do. And the old grandpa lion who doesn't have much muscle left and not much run in him left, but he's got a great roar, gets on one side of the field and he roars. And so where does the animal go when he hears the roar? To the other side of the field, right into the claws of the young, strong lions. That's what the devil does. He makes me afraid, he makes me panic, and then I do something bad, something stupid, something wrong. But he cannot make you do anything. The devil's power. Number three, let's talk about the devil's end. His end. The Bible tells us, number one, that the devil will be bound temporarily. In the order of things to come, the Bible says the church will be delivered from the wrath to come, usually referred to as the rapture. At that time, a clock will start. There will be seven years of tribulation, the last half called the Great Tribulation. At the end of the Great Tribulation, Jesus, and during that time, the false prophet will arise, we read about, and the Antichrist will arise. He'll be a one world uh, ruler. He will die. I think he might commit suicide and then be raised from the dead to prove how powerful he is. And, uh, and then at the end of the seven years, Jesus will come back, the second coming. He'll come back on a white horse, king of kings, lord of lords. 
and he'll destroy the evil at that time. He'll rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. He'll be the king of the whole world, but in particular, the king of the Jews. And a whole host of Old Testament prophecies that were not, have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled during that thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, the devil will be released. So we're, and he'll come back and mount one more rebellion. We're told in Revelation 20, verses one to three, that when Jesus returns this earth after the tribulation, the devil will be bound for a thousand years. After those thousand years, he'll be re released to mount one more uh, rebellion. Jesus, of course, will conquer him finally and, and ultimately. And then number two under that, the devil will be punished eternally. He'll be loosed in the end temporarily, but then he'll be punished eternally. Revelation 20, verse seven to 10 tells us that he will then be thrown into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You've heard me say many times you've been here, heaven was never, or hell was never intended for people. It was never intended for people. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. People's names are blotted out of the book of life. They are never put in. They're only blotted out. So heaven is, is meant for people. Jesus died in our place on the cross, took our punishment so we could be forgiven and go to a heaven we don't deserve rather than the hell that we do. But notice what Jesus said at the end of Matthew 25, 41. He talks about the eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. People say, why does God send people to hell? God never has. What God has done is given people the choice to follow him or not. If you follow him, it leads to heaven. If you don't follow him, it eventually leads to hell. It's that, it's that easy. And in the end, everybody gets what they chose. Frankly, everybody gets what they wanted. Uh, Dallas Willard said, if you don't love Jesus and want to do his will, you wouldn't want to be in heaven. It's going to be an eternity of it. So people go to heaven, get what they want. They want to know the Lord, love the Lord, worship the Lord, obey the Lord, serve the Lord. And people in hell get something they want, which is for God not to leave them alone and not tell them how to live. But they don't realize what all comes with that, the bad part. So the devil will be eternally punished. Finally, let's look at the devil's strategy. The devil's strategy. And it's to do at least four things. Number one, the devil, first of all, these are in order. The first of all, the devil wants to keep you from knowing the God you were made to know. That's his first plan of attack. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Why? So that they would not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jot down John 17, three. There Jesus said, this eternal life, not that you go to heaven when you die, not that you miss hell when you die, not that you get your sins forgiven, this eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus, your son, whom you've sent. Eternal life is not about places, it's about a person. It's not about where you're gonna end up, it's about who you're gonna end up with. It's a person. And the devil wants to keep you from that person, the God you were made for. So the devil, first and foremost, wants to keep you from the God that you were made to know and follow. His greatest victory is if you miss the opportunity Jesus gave you and wind up in hell with him. That is his greatest victory. But that place is not meant for you. But, if he, so let's, but most of us, hopefully, hopefully most all of us, the devil's failed on that one. We have given our lives to the Lord. So what's he up to now? Number two, the devil wants to keep you from becoming the person you were made to be. He wants to keep you from becoming the person you were made to be. The Christian life is not about something I once did. It's about the person I now am and, when, and am still becoming. Once he's lost the major battle to keep you from Christ, he wants to keep you from becoming like Christ. In Romans 8, 29, it says, those whom he foreknew, he knew beforehand who would say yes, who would say no. He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. 
So God's plan for us as believers is to make our character like his. We'll all be unique. We're all different. We have different preferences, different styles, lots of things. But our character should all be the same. In heaven, heaven will be full of all kinds of cultures. Think about that. People from Africa, people from Asia, all, all kinds of cultures. But we'll all have the same character. He wants us to become like he is. Listen to these verses, 1 John 3, 2 to 3. It says there that we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Why? Because we will see him just as he is. So one day we're going to see him as he is and we're going to be like him. We won't be God, but our character will finally be fixed. And it says everyone who has this hope fixed on him, what's that? Of seeing him someday and becoming like him someday, what's that person do? He purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. 1 Peter 1.15 tells us that like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. Not some of it, all of it. Not just the religious parts, but the secular parts. Not just the church, but at school, at work, at play, etc. So the devil, if he can't keep you from saying yes to God, now the next thing he wants to do is keep you from becoming like him. If you remember, Romans 8, 28 tells us that God uses everything that happens in our life, good and bad, for his purpose of making us like himself. And then if that doesn't work, he goes number three. Third of all, the devil wants to keep you from doing the things you were made to do. He wants to keep you from doing the things you were made to do. I ought to be able to wake you up in a dead sleep and say, what did God make you to do? And you ought to be able to tell me. But some of you have no idea what God made you do. You never thought about it. You've never explored it. You've never worked at figuring it out. Some of the things you were made to do are specific and unique to you. Just like I'm supposed to be a pastor, you're not, okay? So it doesn't make me better, it's just different. And you're supposed to be something I'm not. Ephesians 2.10 says that God prepared works beforehand that we should walk in them. So before God even created me, he had a plan of what I would do. And so my job is not to just, is to come to know him, to become, start trying to become like him and try to figure out and do what he made me to do. And, and that'll be unique. There are other more general things that all of us are to do. We're all to love people, serve people, teach people, share the gospel, forgive others. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, listen closely. Jesus says that when we do these things for others, we do them to him. And when we don't do these things for others, we don't do it to him. In verse 46, the verse we read a minute ago, Jesus says as those who don't do what they were supposed to do end up in the lake of fire with the devil. Well, that ought to motivate us to, motivate to know what we ought to do, shouldn't it? Because whatever it is I'm supposed to do, if I don't do it, I'm going to end up making the fire with the devil. That's not, that doesn't sound like a good idea. So see, the devil doesn't just want you to do what you shouldn't do. He wants you not to do what you should do. Some of you are doing a lot better on the former and not very good at all on the latter. So I hope you're not one that Jesus says to you someday, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was uh, sick and you didn't visit me. Here's the fourth one. So the devil first, he wants to keep us from coming to know the Lord. Second, he wants to keep us from becoming like the Lord. Third, he wants to keep us from doing what the Lord wants us to do. Then number four, this is kind of uh, an umbrella catch-all. The devil also wants to mislead you through others. He wants to mislead you through others. What you believe determines how you behave. We behave the way we do because we believe the things we believe. Therefore, the devil is in the mind game business. If you think about the Christian life, where does it happen? We'd call it our spirit and the spirit and soul are used somewhat connected and our mind's a part of our soul. But it happens between the ears. We believe God or we fail to believe God. When I believe what Jesus says is true and right, I do it. It's a battle in the mind. 
That's why Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving. The devil's in the mind game business. We already saw that he blinds those minds. Jesus calls the devil the father of lies in John 8, 44. So the devil gets you to do what you should not do and not do what you should do by getting you to believe what you shouldn't believe. So he gets you to sin by thinking it's okay to commit that sin. Hey, people, they're living together outside of marriage. And they say, you know, uh, uh, we, we prayed about it and God's all right with it. Well, I guarantee you didn't pray to God of the Bible. I don't know who you prayed to. I'm, I'm sure yourself. And you decide it's all right. So see, some people, just they, they just think they, what they believe in their head is that they can get away with all that. And then others believe, some of you believe, well, I can go to church and pretty much do nothing and I'm fine. If you think that, you haven't read your Bible. And I'd suggest you read it. Because the people who didn't do what they should have done ended up in the lake of fire with the devil. Devil, the devil will use people. Remember, we're talking, not being ignorant of his schemes, his purpose. So how will the devil accomplish his purpose? He will use people to mislead you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Stop there. The devil doesn't come to you looking like the devil. He doesn't come in a red suit and, and horns and a pitchfork and a Fu Manchu or whatever kind of beard, facial hair he might have. No, he comes to you looking like Jesus. When he comes to you, it doesn't sound like he's trying to get you not to do the will of God. He's trying to get you to think that what you want to do is the will of God. He's an angel, he disguises himself as an angel of light. And again, in the, the Antichrist, he, 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 he duplicates what Jesus did. He shows up on a white horse. You know your Bible, that's what Jesus shows up on. He dies and gets raised from the dead. If you know your Bible, that's what happened to Jesus. So the same kind of things happen. He's, a, he's, a, he's an artist, a con artist. He comes to you looking like what he wants you to do is the best thing for you. Just like he did Adam and Eve. Well, you know, if you eat of this, your eyes will be open and you'll be wise like God, knowing good from evil. Look at the second part of that verse. Satan disguised himself as an angel light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. So I have three things in this outline, three ways that the devil lies to you and misleads you through others. First one. Number one, the devil misleads through dishonest people. He misleads through dishonest people. Sometimes the devil uses bad people. These people know what they're doing. They know that they're lying to you. They know that they're manipulating you. They're usually gifted, charismatic, and charming, but they're con men. In 1 Samuel 16, 6, Israel was impressed with the wrong guy, Saul. He was chosen to be the first king, and they said this. As soon as they saw him, he was head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. In other words, the tallest person in Israel besides him only came to his shoulders. He was a giant in himself, but remember, he didn't want to mess with uh, uh, Goliath, did he? Some little runt did that, a little guy named David. And so they, Saul comes out and they say, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Boy, he looks like the guy. Doesn't he look like a king? Oh, he's the man. Saul was not a man, he was a mess. He looked like the right guy, tall and handsome. He was the wrong guy. He was an insecure guy, a bad guy, who eventually went literally insane with jealousy over David spent years of his life trying to track David down and kill him. Twice David could have killed him, didn't. Saul repented, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And next thing you know, he's after him again. And would still be if they were alive today, I guess. And then later on, if you remember, he sought out the help of a witch. He was not the right guy. He's what God gave him. 
because they wanted a king. You gotta be careful about pressing God. He might just give you what you want. Some of you have done that in a marriage. You got exactly what you want, found out after you got you didn't want it. Am I in the right room? Some of you might have done that with a car or a business or a job or a lot of other things. Be careful about pressing. Don't kick doors open. If God doesn't open them, leave them closed. You start kicking doors open, God will let you go through one you're not supposed to go through. And that's what happened to Israel. We're told in 1 Samuel 16, 7 that God doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So man looks on appearances, God looks at character. Man looks at what people see, God focuses on what he sees that people do not see. People may be impressed with who we pretend to be, but God knows who we really are. He knows our secrets. Remember these guys who did miracles, they cast out demons, they prophesied his name, did many miracles. They all looked like the right guy. And they weren't. Jesus warned us in Matthew 7, 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So the devil often misleads others through dishonest people. They know what they're doing and they know that you don't know what they're doing. But they look good, they sound good, they attract, they, uh, they attract people and they bring in the cash. And so even when a church finds them out, they're hesitant to do anything about the goose who's laying the golden eggs. And we've seen this multiply, multiple times in mega churches across the country. Some talented guy who builds this supposedly big church congregation, and next thing you know, he's eventually he's found out they had this completely secret life. And even after he's found out, they keep propping him up. They don't want to lose the goose that's laying the golden eggs. If we lose the goose, the gold goes away. The people go away. So we better keep this under wraps. We better try to fix this without anybody knowing. Maybe they won't find out. All right, here's your problem. God found out. God knows what's going on. The devil misleads through dishonest people. Now, here's the second one. And this one's sad. The first one makes you mad. This one makes you sad. The devil misleads through deceived people. Deceived people. The devil maybe more often misleads people through well-meaning but deceived people. They're not con men. They just don't know any better. In Matthew 16, 21 to 23, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem where he would suffer and be killed. Well-meaning, Peter said, God forbid it, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus knew that the devil was using him and he, and he replied this, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me. Peter wasn't a bad person. He was a deceived person. He, did, he wasn't trying to get it wrong. He thought he was getting it right. It sounded like the right thing to say. It sounded like the right thing to do, protect Jesus. But it was the wrong thing to say and the wrong thing to do. The devil misleads through deceived people. I'm of the opinion that the devil's using well-meaning pastors to keep people from really knowing the Lord and actually following him. So what they find is a degree of religion that feels like the real thing, and it's not. It's a good dose of God while we keep our hands and feet in the world. In most cases, it allows us to live pretty much as we want to live if we'll show up at church and maybe throw some money in the offering plate. These people have been taught that, for example, that just praying a prayer or asking Jesus to be their Savior makes them a Christian. Now, if you read your Bible, you know neither of those things is true. Whatever believe means, it's attached to the word obey. You'll find that in John 3, 36. Jesus used them interchangeably. But, it, but the Bible's full of things that tell us what we're supposed to do. So when somebody says, all you gotta do is pray this prayer, then you can know for certain that you'll go to heaven when you die. That's usually not a dishonest man, that's a deceived man. If he's reading his Bible, he's ignoring 
passages of scripture that completely contradict what he's saying. All you gotta do is believe. Well, the devil believes. So we have to really define that word, aren't we? These people have a false rather than a biblical assurance of salvation. I believe that it's also, he also uses well-intentioned pastors to lead people to believe that grace gives them the permission to live however they please. What grace has been so misused today. Oh, don't worry about it if you sin. We're forgiven, we're under grace. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. Worry about it. Grieve over it, weep over it. Have a good clinical depression over it. You probably would if you understood it. It put Jesus, he went to hell for that sin. How dare you take it lightly? Grace doesn't mean we can keep sinning. Grace is the power God gives us not to keep sinning. Remember going back to the apostle Paul mentioned earlier, Paul said, I want rescued. No, God said, I'm gonna give you resources. I'm gonna put more in you than your trial puts on you and I'm gonna make you a better and bigger man because of it. I'm not getting you out of the trouble. I'm making you bigger than it is. I'm resourcing you. And that's what he did. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the gospels, the epistles, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. So does that mean that one time I can say, God, forgive me, I repent, and then now I can sin all I want without repenting? No, there's no way it means that. Grace doesn't void what the rest of the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. But yet some people preach it just like that. I don't think they're bad people. They're not mean people. They're not dishonest people. Sadly, too many preachers have preached what they've heard. I'm one of the guilty parties. We heard it, that's what we preached. A number of years ago, I started reading the Bible and quit filtering it through what I'd heard. And when I started figuring out, it was saying things that went contrary to a lot of things I'd heard. And I'd decide, do I believe the preachers I've heard preach or do I believe what the Bible says? You need to decide the same. By the way, if you're looking for a church, I'll, I'll tell you how to decide, how you decide if this is the one. If you like preaching and religion, this ain't the one. Preaching usually means the performance of the pastor. Because not only does he say some Bible things, he puts on a good show, okay? I don't, have a, I don't have a sale of show in me. If you're looking for God and the word, you found the place. You found the place. But you're looking for a preacher to put on a show? Nah, not here. I can give you some recommendations, but I won't, okay? <laughs> so the devil misleads us through deceived people and dishonest people. And then here's the third one. This is a big one. We're gonna finish here. The devil misleads the lost to think that they are saved. He misleads the lost to think that they are saved. Listen again to the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 21, 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we're in the kingdom of heaven. So just saying Jesus is your Lord doesn't get you in. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. <clears throat> well, I thought all I had to do was pray that prayer. I thought all I had to do was believe. <clears throat> I thought grace meant I didn't have to do all that jazz. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and your name cast out demons, your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Listen real closely to what I'm about to say. If you're lost, the devil wants you to think that you're saved. He wants you, like these miracle workers here, to think that you're okay with God and you really aren't. The miracles they claim to have performed according to Jesus were clearly not evidence that they were Christians. And I'm guessing that's bigger evidence than most of us can produce, isn't it? At least for show. What they did in their private lives, their secrets condemned them. They didn't live by God's laws. God doesn't just see the show we put on. He sees who we really are. There are a lot of people who could talk Jesus really good, but they don't know him. 
And you could probably think of some people like that. So how do you know they don't know him? Because of the way they live. They didn't live by God's laws. The evidence of biblical salvation is not something you once did. It's not who you profess to be. It's who you actually are. God put a whole book in the Bible about it. First John, first John, all five chapters. These things I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. So how do I know? We're gonna go back and see what it said. One of the things it says is, by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If we don't keep his commandments, we make him a liar. A lot of people have a false assurance of salvation based upon their ignorance of the Bible, somebody telling them something like, all you gotta do is believe or pray a prayer and you're saved. Or a third one is some preacher misrepresenting the truth that once a person genuinely is saved, the person is always saved. Now, do I believe in once saved, always saved? From the tip of my toe to the top of my head. But you gotta really get saved before that's true. You can pray a prayer and not really be saved. You can walk an aisle and not really be saved. You can get baptized so many times your skin wrinkles up and not be saved. You could rededicate a hundred times and not be saved. But once you're really his, you'll never not be his. Well, how do I know if I'm really his? Because he changes you. A Christian can't not change. How can the God, how can the, a, a person of the Godhead live inside of you and he not change you? Does it make sin unattractive? I hadn't found that to be true. Does it make obedience easy? I hadn't found that always to be true. But I'll tell you one thing, I can never be who I was because I'm not that person anymore. And I can't enjoy sin because the one who came to deliver me from it lives in me. So if I'm not repenting right now, it's right around the corner. God lives in the believer. But how many people have been saved? Remember seeing a thing, post, a little kid got saved, you know, got saved, got baptized, a little big kid, and, and, and the pastor said, now he knows for certain that if he dies, he'll go to heaven. I wanted to scream. Show me that in the Bible. Well, I know preachers have said it for a hundred years since we try to get people down the aisle, get them baptized so the preacher looks good and the people in the congregation get a good feel. Show me that in the Bible. The proof that you're saved is the life that you live. It's not something you once did. It's not who you claim to be. And that's what the book of 1 John's about. Don't take my word for it. Check it out. On the other hand, if you're saved... The devil wants you to think that you're lost. If you're doubting whether or not you're in God's family, you can't enjoy the relationship with God the Father that he wants you to experience. So if I'm not saved, he wants me to think I am. Then I get myself, I take myself out of the category of needing to be saved. But if I am saved, what's the devil gonna do? He's gonna try to make me doubt it. You say, this is confusing. It really is. Anybody tells you it's not, in The devil's a confusing guy. He's a liar and he's really good at it. Been doing it for a long time. Listen closely. If you grew up feeling unloved and secure, or loved and feeling loved and secure, you probably never doubt your salvation. It never rears your mind. But if you, feel, if you grew up feeling unloved, insecure, thinking you never measured up, you've likely doubt, doubted your salvation a lot. And every time you hear a message like this, you go, oh man, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Do you see how the two are connected? If I wasn't enough for my parent or my friends, how in the world could I ever be enough for God? So you gotta figure that out. Am I a lost man who thinks I'm saved and needs to be saved? Am I a saved person? But I have doubts just because I was raised in a, on a healthy diet of doubts. I was raised to doubt myself, raised to doubt if anybody could love me, raised to doubt if anybody could want me, raised to doubt if I could ever be anything or accomplish anything. Well, of course you're gonna struggle with those things. 
That's why you got to come back to the word. What does the word of God say? My hope is built on nothing less than what I feel and what I guess. That's what most people do. No, that's not how it goes. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You need to tell yourself the truth. God is not your parent, your dysfunctional parent or friend. He's a God who loves you because of how good he is, not because of how good you are. Once you truly become his, you can't not be his. You probably think, but I'm not worthy of God's love. Get in line and take a number. None of us are worthy of God's love. That's where grace comes in. He gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us what we cannot earn. He loves those who are undeserving of his love. That includes me and that includes you. Hi guys, in the message you just heard, at the end, I used a word uh, that I really regretted using afterwards. And that was the word deceived. I talked about how people, Satan uses people to mislead people and he uses dishonest people, he does. He does use deceived people, but then I gave an illustration about uh, how some people preach easy believism. All you gotta do is pray this prayer, even though nobody ever prayed a prayer in scripture to become a Christian. Or say, all you gotta do is believe. Well, that's true if you have the biblical definition of belief, which a lot of people don't. And so if you, if you read the rest of Scripture, it begins to contradict those things pretty clearly and pretty loudly. A better word would have been Ill, uh, ill-advised or uh, ill-informed. A lot of well-meaning preachers are just like I was for the first 20-something years of my ministry. I just kind of preached what I heard. If the guys I liked preached it and said it, that's what I said. But then as I began to read the Bible and take seriously all the pieces of it because it's all inspired by God, I saw that many of the things I was reading were coming into conflict with the things I was saying. And so I was one of those people, quote, deceived or ill-advised or ill-informed. And I had to decide that I was gonna preach what the whole Bible said and in particular, not just what I'd heard. So there are a lot of well-meaning preachers with great hearts who were just like I was. I I had a great heart, I was well-meaning, but I was not including all the Bible in my doctrine of salvation. And so uh, that's the kind of person I'm talking to. And the sad thing is, is there, there, Jesus says there are many who think they're going to heaven who are not. And, and one of the reasons for that is for us to make salvation uh, just boil it down to agreeing with some ideas or just saying some words in a prayer. I hope this brings clarity and you may have a wonderful pastor who doesn't see this as I see it yet. Uh, We're all learning and uh, I found my way there. Maybe he'll find his way too.